Okay, so we've been talking about angular momentum, which is some kind of a measure of going aroundness. <laughs> um, and uh, and there is angular momentum in situations where you think there ought to be something spinning has angular momentum, something orbiting, something else has angular momentum. <coughs> uh, the formalism <coughs> is a little abstract because, as you recall, in order to say which way something is rotating. <coughs> and to say it in a way that works mathematically. So there's no mathematical operators for clockwise and counterclockwise. So what we use is to define a direction of angular momentum, remember that we, <coughs> we decide on the plane in which something is orbiting or rotating. <coughs> and then the angular momentum is mathematically considered to be a vector that's perpendicular to that plane and whose direction is determined by using your right hand. So if something is going around that way, your fingers curl in the direction of motion and angular momentum would be into the page relative to some location. And that's the other thing, we have to specify a location around which we're gonna calculate angular momentum. Usually um, when we're solving a problem, it's fairly clear what we wanna take is the location. Um, and for a spinning thing, it's easy for, for something that's orbiting. What we have to do is take location A, draw a vector R from location A to wherever our object is, and then take the cr vector cross product of R cross A, which means to find the direction, and in fact to check the direction, we're going to point our, our fingers in the direction of this vector r, which is the first vector. <coughs> so ideally, we're really going to put them tail to tail, but so you can imagine putting r that way. So we point our fingers in the direction of r, we keep our wrist rigid, but we curl our fingers toward p and our thumb sticks out in the direction of the, the cross product, which is a direction that's perpendicular to the plane defined by those two vectors. And that's the mathematical formalism we use to calculate <coughs> uh, <coughs> angular momentum. And remember that, that um, the magnitude of <coughs> R cross P is the magnitude of R the magnitude of P sine theta. Um, and the direction is given by this right hand rule. And then there's another way of really calculating it out where we have RA cross P is a vector where we have, <coughs> I'm going to leave off the, the A just to not have thousands of subscripts here. So <coughs> the X component is RYPZ minus RZ <coughs> PY. The Y component is going to be RZ PX minus RX PZ. And the Z component is Rx Py minus Ry Px. And by using the right hand rule often, I mean, we're gonna try to make this easy by using sort of obvious planes most of the time. And so if we're using the right hand rule, you can tell which component is gonna be non-zero. So you end up really usually only having to calculate one component this way. <coughs> <coughs> and we calculated angular momentum in a variety of situations in lecture and in recitation last Thursday. <coughs> so today what we need to do is 
flesh out the angular momentum principle, which is another fundamental principle. Uh, fundamental principle, again, means that it applies to everything in the universe, from elementary particles to galactic clusters. Uh, and we can write it the way we're used to writing principles, which says that if we consider two situations, initial and final situation, the angular momentum of our system in the final situation is equal to its initial angular momentum plus inputs from the surroundings. And these inputs from the surroundings in this case come as a torque. So our task today is to understand torque, when there is a torque, when there isn't a torque, um, and what it does. And it's not very surprising. This looks a lot like one way of writing the momentum principle, right? Because we've got another delta t here this time. So the torque applied for a given time changes the angular momentum. And a torque is basically just a twist. So how do we figure out torques? Well, <coughs> When you're twisting something, you can twist it one way or you can twist it the other. You can twist the bottle cap on or you can twist it off. You can use a wrench to tighten a nut or, or loosen a nut. Okay, so we have this counterclockwise thing going on and we're going to do the same thing saying, uh, <coughs> given a plane, use your right hand. So counterclockwise would be out of the plane, clockwise is into the plane. We're going to use a vector for torque. <coughs> so let's consider uh, a wrench. <coughs> which is exerting, which is twisting a nut. Um, <coughs> and we can apply forces in different ways to this wrench to, to loosen or tighten the nut. <coughs> so we could apply a force by pushing down on the handle like that. <coughs> We could apply a force here instead by using the same magnitude of force but pushing here. Um, we could, in principle, apply a force, we'll call that F1, F2, by pushing that way. And these forces have different effects. So, so let's see if we can come up with a, a mathematical expression for torque that captures these effects. Now, suppose I'm trying to, to loosen this nut. Uh, and I'm going to exert a force of the same magnitude. Which is the best place to exert it? Which, which of these would do, be the most effective? Yeah, so F1. So if I, if I push down here, that's, that's going to give me the most bang for the buck. That's going to be the most effective. If I push here, will it work? Yeah, but not quite as well. What if I push that way? I won't do anything, <laughs> right? <coughs> okay. <coughs> so, so we want this to be the biggest torque and this to be a little bit smaller torque and this to actually be zero torque to come out to this. <coughs> so, torque around some location A and what do you think we ought to take as location A here? We're twisting around what location? Yeah, the, the here. So, that's gonna be location A. <coughs> It needs to involve the force 
And somehow it needs to involve the, the position where we're exerting the force, right? <coughs> and so presumably there's some vector that goes from from location A to the location where the force is applied. <coughs> and so it should involve this, this vector, R sub A. <coughs> and let's see, the, the bigger R is, the, the, the bigger the torque, right? So, so in terms of magnitude, it should be proportional to the magnitude of R. The bigger the force, clearly, the, the bigger the torque, so it should be <coughs> proportional to the magnitude of the force. And then there's something about the angle between <coughs> R and the force, because this force is at the same location and it has the same magnitude, but it's actually not doing anything. <coughs> And so the angle between R and F here looks like 180 degrees. And we want that to come out to a zero. So, so guess what? We've got sine theta again, where theta is the angle between R and F. Um, and that looks like a cross product. What that would give us if we said R cross F is into the board, that corresponds to a clockwise twist, which is what we want. So in fact, torque is yet another cross product of the vector from the location around which we're taking the torque to the point where the force is applied, crossed by the force. So this is exactly the same operation <coughs> um, when we calculated angular momentum. Um, so let's think about torque a little bit. <coughs> so here's um, here's a yo-yo and a yo-yo has a, a little inner disk that the string is wound around that has a smaller radius than the, the outer radius of the yo-yo, right? <coughs> so the string is wrapped around this inner cylinder of radius small r. <coughs> and at this instant, you are pulling up on the string. The yo-yo is falling, maybe. Maybe going up. The yo-yo is doing something. And you're pulling up on the string, OK? <coughs> So the question is, what is the direction of the torque that the string, that, that you, you the force you exert, what's the direction of the, the torque that the force you exert uh, exerts on the yo-yo with the usual coordinate system? So think for a minute, what's R, what's F? What's the direction of the twist? Does this make sense?
Okay, so what do you think? <laughs> okay, so we're getting, I'm getting some sixes, some twos, five. Okay, so, so first of all, we need to, so I, I think more sixes than anything else, but, um, so first of all, what location are we going to take as the location around which we're going to determine a torque? What, what is A here? Probably there, right? Because that's what the yo-yo is going to rotate around. That, so the center, center mass of the yo-yo. So that's, that's location A. <coughs> Okay, what is the vector R? There are actually two ways you can think about this, aren't there? So depending on what you choose as your system. So suppose we chose the yo-yo alone as the system then what's the point where the force is being applied to the yo-yo? The, the string is not part of the system then. So it's gonna be, gonna be applied right here, isn't it? Yeah. So it looks like the vector r goes from the center of the yo-yo to the, the edge of this disk where the, the force is being applied. And then we're pulling up with a force F. So R cross F. So what's the direction? Put them tail to tail. R cross F out of the board, yes, plus C. So if you said five, <coughs> questions about that? <coughs> now what if we said the system is the the yo-yo plus the string? <coughs> Are we gonna get a different answer? Now we're exerting a force at that location. <coughs> so we have R, F, R cross F, still the same direction, right? <coughs> Questions? Okay, you look sort of stunned, so I don't know whether whether you're just tired or it's obvious or uh, it's confusing. <laughs> okay. Um, <coughs> so what's the magnitude of the torque? So the force is magnitude is 0.6 newtons and little r is 5 millimeters and big r is 0.3.5 centimeters. <coughs>
Okay, so what's the answer? The answer is two. Yes. So we have magnitude of the torque. Magnitude of R times the magnitude of F. So that's 0 0.005 meters times 0 0.6 newtons. Uh, assuming that we're thinking about the string applying the force here. And that gives us 0 0.003, what are the units of this thing anyway? Newton meters? Newton meters. <coughs> Would we have gotten a different answer if we had calculated it here? <coughs> so we want the Z component, right? So that's going to be Rx <coughs> Fy minus Ry <coughs> Fx. Right? Uh, what's the x component of the force that we're exerting? Zero. zero. So that's a zero. <coughs> so it looks like that's going to be Rx Fy, which is what we just calculated here 0 0.005 meters times 0.6 newtons is 0. Point So look, the component of R perpendicular to the force that actually is going to come into it here, yes? So why would the magnitude change if the angle sine theta changed? Like example, um, <coughs> so if you're calculating it this way, so, so when we calculate it this way, we see what components come into it. <coughs> And so the question is, but the angle changed here because theta is now <coughs> that angle. So the angle's a lot smaller, right? So sine theta is a lot smaller. But what got bigger? <laughs> yeah, the magnitude of R got bigger. <coughs> okay? <coughs> So what's the magnitude of the... So other questions about that? Yes, no. So what's the magnitude of the torque exerted by the Earth on the yo-yo? <coughs> so if we just release the yo-yo <coughs> in the middle of the air, <coughs> It's going to fall, right? Is it going to spin? So what's, what's making it twist? So here's, <coughs> here's the yo-yo. <coughs> the force exerted by the Earth is down. <coughs> what's the torque exerted by the Earth on the yo-yo? So we consider gravitational forces to be acting at the center of mass of an object. <coughs> um, this c you can prove that that you can prove that that's a legitimate <coughs> that that's how it works out. Um, in which case, the magnitude of R, which goes from the center of mass of the yo-yo to the point of application of this gravitational force, is zero. So in fact. There is no torque due to the gravitational force. 
Now, so, so the Earth, the, the gravitational force itself is not going to make it spin. You've got to pull on that string to make the yo-yo spin. So uh, this week in lab, you are um, <coughs> looking at, that's not the one I want, uh, <coughs> <coughs> Okay, so the, the, as usual, the Monday lab are pioneers, and what you're doing in lab this week is you're looking at angular momentum in an orbit program like the one you wrote, a spacecraft orbiting the Earth. You, you're starting from a, a simple version of that, a little bit cleaned up from the last version you had, but, um, and make, we're gonna having, having it orbit in the XZ plane just to make life simple. <coughs> so, um, <coughs> So one of the things that's interesting is to take the location A at the center of the Earth. <coughs> and we see here that the angular momentum seems not to be changing. <coughs> what if we take it some other location? Here. So some people who've done it, say it's going to change, um, and it does. <coughs> so this is the angular momentum of the spacecraft relative to that location. So why would the angular momentum be changing according to the angular momentum principle? Well, what does it say right here? <coughs> So L final is L initial plus net torque times delta T. We can write that, of course, as um, <coughs> DL DT equals the net torque acting on something. If angular momentum's changing, what has to be true? Non-zero net torque, right? <coughs> and where does that come from? Well, the only thing exerting forces on this planet is the Earth. So it must be that when you take R here to some location here, R, if this is R and the force is that way, R cross F is not zero. <coughs> and so there is a torque. So the point at which you choose angular, or at which you choose angular momentum depends on, tells you whether there's going to be a torque or not. <coughs> and you'll get a chance to experiment with that in lab. <coughs> All right. Uh, <coughs> Let's see, I want a question that isn't here. <coughs> okay, never mind. Do it ourselves. <coughs> <coughs> so suppose we have an object who has a certain angular momentum. And since this has numbers, let me actually correctly. 
<coughs> so we've got an object whose angular momentum around some location A is 150, uh, 20 kilogram meters squared per second. And there's a net torque acting on it of 12, 0, negative 3, Newton meters. Uh, what's the angular gonna, momentum going to be three seconds later? <coughs> so how do we calculate it? <coughs> What do we do? <coughs> so we just have to add initial angular momentum. <coughs> to the net torque <laughs> times three seconds. <coughs> so three times 12 is 36. So we're going to get 136. 50 plus zero is 50. 20 plus negative 3 times 3, 20 plus a negative 9 is 11. Okay, so you've done that before, right? <coughs> so in principle here, So we can use, if we know the torque, we can calculate a change in angular momentum. If we know the torque and the time it acts, we can calculate a change in angular momentum. Remember this example of we have this object that has spokes and masses and we drop a lump of clay, um, which Now clearly the rotational angle the momentum of this wheel device is non-zero. <coughs> and if we knew the torque, we could, we could have predicted that. But we'd have to know exactly the force that the clay exerted on the, the wheel for exactly how long to do that. And there are lots of cases where we don't know, <coughs> we can't actually calculate a torque. <coughs> So just like we did with momentum, there were cases where we didn't know a force, <coughs> but we could take two objects as the system and say, well, the total angular momentum of the system before the interaction and the total angular momentum of the total momentum of the system before the interaction, total momentum afterwards had to be the same because there's the surroundings weren't interacting with them. We can do exactly the same thing with angular momentum. So we can say, we can use the principle in the form that um, change of angular momentum of a system is the net torque from the surroundings. Choose our system to have enough have two interacting objects in it and the surroundings aren't exerting a significant twist or torque on the system, then 
this can be zero and then angular momentum is the same before and after the, the collision. So previously we've used, in collisions, we've used <coughs> momentum first just to, and then momentum and energy with the same scheme. And now we can use momentum, energy, and angular momentum. <coughs> so here is uh, a system that we're going to use for this. Um, let's see if I can find a picture here and then I'll try to... <coughs> There. <coughs> okay, so <coughs> this is a device like you see on some playgrounds. It's a disc on an axle, a merry-go-round thing. You can push it and then jump on it and ride around, okay? So, so here's, our, here's our situation. <coughs> um, the kid <coughs> runs toward this... Um, <coughs> This merry-go-round thing, which is at rest, jumps on it. The merry-go-round starts to turn. And there are, a lot, there are various questions we can ask. We can ask uh, what the final angular speed of the merry-go-round. Um, we can ask about final momentum. We can ask about final kinetic energy. So we can actually use all of these things. <coughs> so let's um, <coughs> let's give this some <coughs> so we can eventually actually get numbers. <coughs> so <coughs> from a top view here so here's our merry-go-round, the kid is running along here, uh, the kid's mass is 40 kilograms, They're running at three meters per second to start out, so not super fast. <coughs> this radius here is two meters. <coughs> the mass of this disc is 300 kilograms. <coughs> this, the disc is initially at rest and we want to know the final angular speed of this uh, of this apparatus. So this is presumably in the XZ plane, so that's X, and this is Z, and we're sitting on the Y axis looking down with the camera. <coughs> so here's a situation where we don't actually know the torque that the kid is going to exert on the merry-go-round. So we're going to need to take the kid plus the merry-go-round as our system and use the form of the principle where we say there's nothing in the surroundings that's twisting, that's exerting a torque on either the kid or the merry-go-round, so therefore the total angular momentum of the system before and the total angular momentum of the system afterwards <coughs> has to be, have to be the same. <coughs> mm. 
Oh, and this distance seems to be five meters. <coughs> so, how is this going to work out? So we've got, you know, what, do, what do you think we should take as our location A? Center of the merry-go-round, yeah. <coughs> And so this is the initial, the final angular momentum of the kid plus the final <coughs> angular momentum of the, the disk <coughs> is equal to <coughs> the initial angular momentum of the kid plus the <coughs> So this is going to be rotational angular momentum, right? Because the disk is rotating about it, an axle in the center. So this is going to be rotational. Uh, what's the initial angular momentum of the disk is fortuitously zero because it's at rest, so that part's nice. <coughs> so the kit isn't, at this point, rotating on its own axis. <coughs> so therefore, the kid has presumably translational angular momentum. <coughs> and even though, the, now it makes sort of, it makes some sense that even, even though the, the kid is moving in a straight line, <coughs> we can attribute angular momentum to the kid because that angular momentum is going to get transferred to the, to the disk when the kid gets on. So it actually, it sounds a little formal, but it actually makes some sense. <coughs> So, so we don't know this stuff, but we can start out by calculating this. <coughs> so this is R A cross P. So here's R sub A goes from location A to the the kids location. So that's going to be equal to uh, so minus 5 meters in the x direction, I mean, yes, x direction, and then given our axis system here, uh, it's going to be minus 2 meters in the z direction. And the kid's momentum, 40 kilograms, times three meters per second sounds like 12 kilogram meters per second and that is in the plus x direction <coughs> yes what right <coughs> thank you Very low mass kid. <laughs> um, <coughs> okay. <coughs> so which component of this is going to be non-zero? <coughs> Just <coughs> hauling out our right hands and looking at this diagram. <coughs> what's going to be the direction of the kid's angular momentum with respect to A? <coughs> Uh, we got a 
point our right hand along R, right? And then we need to curl our, so put R up here. <coughs> we need to curl our fingers toward P, but I can't do it with my hand this way, so I have to do that. <coughs> so then my thumb sticks into the board. So it's going to be uh, minus Y, isn't it? <coughs> So it's going to be zero, and the y component is going to be <coughs> rz px, so minus two times one twenty minus rx, which is negative five times pz which is zero <coughs> so we get zero negative 240 zero kilogram meters squared per second right <coughs> for the initial <coughs> angular momentum of the kid <coughs> Now, is that angular momentum going to change as the kid approaches the disk? Yeah, so we, we kind of want the angular momentum of the kid right at the instant before they they stick to the disk, right? And it is the case that the magnitude of R is decreasing. <coughs> but something else is changing too, right? What else is changing? What's happening to theta? So theta is changing too, isn't it? Because there's the angle between <coughs> Between R and P, R is changing to be like that. So let's let's calculate the angular momentum right right before the kid jumps on the on the disc. So this is this is two. Okay, so R is now zero minus two zero meters and P is one twenty zero zero <coughs> meters and that's going to give us <coughs> okay, so we have <coughs> Uh, <coughs> Rz times <coughs> Px. <coughs> yes, thank you. <coughs> thank you. Um, <coughs> so we have Rz px, which is negative 2 times 120 minus Rx times Pz. <coughs> uh, <coughs> so we get 0, negative 240, 0 kilogram meter squared per second. <coughs> so, so it comes out the same. <coughs> so it keeps turning out that it's only this component of R that's perpendicular to P that really ends up contributing to that cross product. Or if you're thinking about it in terms of the <coughs> R and sine theta, you have to remember that as R is changing, theta is changing also. So here theta is now 90 degrees, which just means we could get the magnitude really easily. It's just R times P times 1. 
Okay, so it turns out the angular momentum of the kid isn't actually changing as they run along toward the merry-go-round, so we're, <coughs> we're good there. <coughs> um, <coughs> so we've got the, the initial angular momentum. <coughs> so... <coughs> Think about the final angular momentum of this system here. <coughs> and that's got that's got two ports. It's got the angular momentum. <coughs> of the kid plus the <coughs> angular momentum of the disk. <coughs> and we can write this as the moment of inertia of the disk times the final angular velocity because it's just spinning around its center. So this is going to be rotational angular momentum, right? <coughs> and that's going to be, which way is the disk going to turn? that way. It's going to be in the minus y direction. <coughs> and this presumably is now, <coughs> this is <coughs> ra across <coughs> the momentum of the kid. <coughs> we know, <coughs> we know r because it's just that vector, but we don't know what the kid's momentum is. And it looks like we've got two unknowns. And that's kind of a problem, but remember that for something that's that's going around, the speed is equal to the angular speed times the radius because it's two pi r over the period, and that's the angular speed. <coughs> so we can actually rewrite this as <coughs> um, <coughs> RA cross the mass of the kid <coughs> times <coughs> the radius of the disk times <coughs> the final angular velocity of the <coughs> merry-go-round. <coughs> and we know these are both going to be in the minus y direction, so we can, <coughs> we can now happily take magnitudes. <coughs> So we have um, we have an m r squared omega final plus uh, moment of inertia times omega final, <coughs> and the moment of inertia of a disk uh, is what. I think it's one half m r squared. <coughs> Let's look it up. <coughs> uh, <coughs> <coughs> so let's. And now we have got a bunch of stuff we know. 
So we know the mass of the kid, we know the radius of the disk. <coughs> we know the mass of the disk and the radius of the disk. <coughs> and we know that the final angular momentum is equal to the initial angular momentum. So this is going to be 240 kilogram meters squared per second. And we can solve for the final angular speed of the disk, right? <coughs> and do you want to do arithmetic? <laughs> no. It's 0.316 radians per second. <coughs> Now, there's a point here that's just a little bit subtle. Why did we calculate, so we used, we calculated the translational angular momentum of the kid who's orbiting around A, and the rotational angular momentum of the disk. So why didn't we just add the kid into the, the moment of inertia of the disk? And the answer is that once the kid gets on here, the center of mass changes. <laughs> So you'd have to calculate the moment of inertia around some off-center center of mass, which is not nice. So it's actually much easier to just take the disk as the disk and the, the kid is a, a thing stuck to the disk but orbiting around. Now we left out something. We left out a piece of angular momentum. What do we leave out? Well, there are no external torques, okay? The Earth is just pulling down. That's not making anything twist. <coughs> so we, we, we accounted for the rotational angular momentum of the disk. We accounted for the translational angular momentum of the kid. <coughs> so let's... <coughs> this is a small effect, but it is there. <coughs> let's... Um, <coughs> Let's think about the kid, a baseball cap, okay? <clears throat> so here's the kid with uh, the brim of their cap pointing that way. <clears throat> and so here's the kid has rotated through a quarter of a turn and now the brim of their cap is pointing that way. <clears throat> and now here's the kid with the brim of their cap pointing that way and here they are with the brim of their cap pointing that way. <coughs> so the orientation of the kid's <coughs> cap is actually changing. So as the wheel makes a turn, the kid is rotated on their own axis by 180 degree, by 200, by, by, by 2 pi. <coughs> 360 degrees. So therefore, the kid actually has a little bit of rotational angular momentum <coughs> around their own center of mass. <coughs> it's small. <laughs> and, the, and the angular speed is actually exactly the same as the angular speed of the disk because it took exactly the same time to make one rotation. But we didn't, we didn't account for that little piece. <coughs> So is this collision elastic or not elastic? <coughs> so not elastic, why? How do we know that? Because it's a sticking collision, the kid's stuck. Which means that kinetic energy <coughs> would change in this collision, right? Some of the kid's initial kinetic energy is going to go into internal energy of the kid disk system. <coughs> so, so how would we calculate that? <coughs> so here's omega final is... <coughs> how would we how would we calculate the change in kinetic energy, <coughs> the rise of internal energy of the... <coughs> we 
we can calculate the kid's initial kinetic energy, right? So, <coughs> the final kinetic energy has two pieces. It's the rotational kinetic energy of the disk. plus the translational kinetic energy of the kid. <coughs> so this is just half times the moment of inertia of the disk times this <coughs> omega final that we found squared, right? <coughs> and this is half mass of the kid V final squared, how do we figure out V final of the kid? So we know, <coughs> so we're back to V is equal to omega R, right? So this is just going to be <coughs> omega final R squared. <coughs> and K final minus K initial <coughs> should give us the, the change in internal energy of the um, <coughs> so it turns out uh, if you work out the numbers <coughs> that this comes out to, what did I just say, hundred and, this is 180 joules. <coughs> and this whole thing is 38 joules. So a fair amount of the kinetic energy, the initial kinetic energy actually went into internal energy of the disk. <coughs> Okay, so that's two principles. <coughs> Let's think about the momentum principle. <coughs> so, <coughs> we're going to take a moment right, right before the kid jumps on and then a moment right after the kid's jumped on the disc. So what happens to the, and we're going to take the disc and the kid as the, the system. <coughs> so right before the kid jumps on the disc, <coughs> the kid has some momentum. <coughs> and right after the kid's jumped on the disc, <coughs> the kid has instantaneously some momentum in the same direction, but it's actually a lot smaller. <coughs> um, <coughs> What do we have? We had 120 <coughs> kilogram meters per second, and here we have uh, <coughs> 40 kilograms <coughs> times 0.3 uh, radians per second times 2 meters, <coughs> so 80 times 0.3 is three times eight is 25, 24. So, and the disc isn't going that way. So it seems like the momentum of the system was not the same before and after this collision. Why not? Yeah? No, see, momentum can be converted into angular momentum, unfortunately. So momentum is momentum, and the momentum principle always applies regardless of whether something is spinning or, or vibrating or anything. It's still... <coughs> so... 
So momentum, momentum doesn't get converted into energy. Momentum doesn't get converted into angular momentum. Angular momentum doesn't get, con yeah, okay. They're all separate. <coughs> so, so what does the momentum principle actually say though? <coughs> So if delta P is not zero, what has to be true? There has to have been a force, doesn't there? What exerted a force on this system? <coughs> so if this was on ice, so here's a disc on ice. <coughs> Kid runs, <coughs> jumps on the disc. Disc is going to slide, right? It's going to spin, but it's going to slide. Okay, it's not sliding here. <coughs> what kept it from sliding? A force by... <coughs> yeah, 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 the axle's anchored in the earth, isn't it? <laughs> yep. So, <coughs> kid jumps on. <coughs> the, the whole apparatus wants to go this way and the earth exerts a big force backwards. So the force, the external force is not zero in this case. Does, does actually change. <coughs> and we could calculate the impulse, right? Because we know the momentum before and the momentum after, so we could actually <coughs> calculate <coughs> the impulse. <coughs> hmm? Yeah, so all three principles. <coughs> <coughs> Questions? So since we're talking about the momentum principle here, I would like to go back to a problem we had on the test and talk about it because performance was not awesome and it was just a momentum <coughs> problem. <coughs> and so it's the pendulum problem where we have, <coughs> yep, that problem. <laughs> so what I want to talk about is reasoning from the momentum principle. <coughs> so the first question was, so this pendulum is, there's a mass on a, on a, a string. <coughs> it's swinging from A to B to C. We observe it at the instant it, it gets to B, which is at the lowest point in its motion. <coughs> and the first question is of the, the momentum of the mass, and I think everybody got that right. <coughs> so, <coughs> momentum's that way, tangent to the path. <coughs> the second question, though, was at that instant, <coughs> What's the direction of dp dt? <coughs> and that was not awesome, but remember we have, we have a procedure for figuring this out. <coughs> because the direction of dp dt is the same as the direction of delta p over delta t. And so if we take a time interval where this is at the center, so times equal times on each side of this. And we happen to know that it speeds up until it gets here and it slows down until it comes to a stop. So 
<coughs> the magnitude of momenta is going to be the same at each of these these locations. <coughs> so we've got P initial going down, P final going up. <coughs> we take these vectors, <coughs> we put them tail to tail, we subtract, <coughs> we get delta P. Okay, so this isn't remembering. This is you don't memorize it, but you have a you have a procedure for figuring it out no matter what the situation is. <coughs> you know, we could be have some trajectory like that. It doesn't it doesn't matter, <laughs> right? You have this procedure that always works. <coughs> so you use this procedure and you say fine, delta p is up. <coughs> so dp dt is indeed up. <coughs> So what does the momentum principle tell us has to be the direction of the net force on the mass? Up, yep, yep. So this equation, this... <coughs> if that's up, that's up, <coughs> right? And that means the sum of the forces, the vector sum of the forces acting on it has to be up. So this is not, you're not supposed to remember this, you're supposed to figure it out by thinking about the principle and what it means. And I think we may need to practice to get it fresh again. Okay, see you this afternoon. <laughs>